the state director of Doctors for America, which is a national organization focused on enrollment, Medicaid expansion, and other issues. Um, and he's also an associate clinical professor, professor of pediatrics here at Case. Um, and then we have Lauren Anthes here. He is in state and, uh, state and local associate in government relations for the Metro Health System. And he was a part of the Northeast Ohio uh, Medicaid Expansion Coalition. So he's been very involved in that. And he's going to talk about Medicaid expansion. Um, next, we have Sarah Hockenbrocht, who is the executive director of the Cuyahoga Health Access Partnership. And she's involved in healthcare navigation and enrollment here in Cleveland. So she's going to talk about enrollment here in Cleveland and in Ohio. And finally, we have David Bransfield, who is the state coordinator of Young Invincibles, uh, which is a national organization located in Washington, DC. He's flown all the way out here from DC, and we're really lucky to have him with us today. Um, so as we go throughout the presentation, if you have a burning question, feel free to raise your hand. We have Andrea over there and Sheila somewhere else with microphones that will bring the microphone to you. So make sure you wait until the microphone is in your hands before you go ahead and ask the question because we are recording today and we want to make sure that we get all these questions recorded for people um, who watch the recordings later to hear. Um, and then we're also going to have a question and answer session after all the panelists speak. Um, so feel free to save your questions to the end as well. Um, and again, thank you so much for being here. Okay. Thanks, Tori. First of all, thanks to Tori for this amazing event and uh, panel. I'm really honored to be part of it. Um, uh, my name is Arthur Lavin. I'm a practicing pediatrician. And my job is to go over a 100-year history of what brought us to Obamacare today. And the organizations are behind it in 10 minutes. So uh, the clock has begun. Um, what we're, what we're here to talk about is the Patient Portability and Affordable Care, I'm sorry, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, known as the Affordable Care Act, and affectionately known as Obamacare. And I'm here as a representative of two organizations. One is National, Tory's part of this group as well, Doctors for America, which is a group of 16,000 progressive doctors across the United States who are doing what we can to make health care more just and um, accessible to people. And the local manifestation has a group called Doctors uh, for Healthcare Solutions. And this is 600 doctors just in the greater Cleveland area. Any of you are able to sign up for this. I'm going to pass around right now some email sign-up lists. So uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll all feel compelled to join. Here you go. So um, really what I want to talk about are three things, care, cost, and quality. This is this law is, I believe, one of the uh, biggest pieces of legislation since really the New Deal. In some ways, it's bigger than Medicare and Medicaid because Medicare addressed the needs of those 65 and up, Medicaid, the aged, uh, disabled, and, um, and certain other subpopulations, the poor especially. But this law applies to every single person in the United States. And it looks at how we're going to get more people the care they need, how it's going to cost less, and, and we don't hear about in the news so much, but uh, I'm going to spend a moment talking about how this is a breakthrough piece of legislation in terms of the issue of quality in medicine, which I think is, should be close to the heart of anyone attached to the medical profession in any way, shape, or form. So the basics, I just want to cover a couple context points. The first is, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, I think you have to agree that health care costs money. So no matter how we're going to do this, uh, take care of people in the United States is going to cost money. And a question right up front is whether that cost is shared or entirely responsible to someone who's ill. I think it was okay that people bore their own costs back before there was medicine and there really wasn't anything anyone could do. Uh, there were costs involved in running to get the village doctor, but not a lot of cost. In 1900, the average doctor's income was equal to the average car mechanic's income. But things have changed since then. And uh, Right now, you could, any of us tomorrow, could have a discovery that could cost us several million dollars. And um, right now, before this law was passed, we'll talk about this in a moment, the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States was waking up tomorrow with something that cost several million dollars to cure. So the question is, should we just play roulette wheel and everyone manage their own costs? If you're the unlucky person tomorrow who wakes up with a multi-million dollar diagnosis, your life is ruined. Or are we a country where this cost is shared across the whole country? The United States turns out to be the only country that has the resources to cover everyone's costs where this is a controversy. 
there is no other country with the wealth able to cover cost of health care where there's any discussion about this question. In every other country, the decision's been loud and clear. We don't want to play roulette. We want to share the costs. And sharing costs is really a different model of insurance. We don't have time to go into the difference there. But the idea of sharing the costs is what um, Obamacare, the um, Affordable Care Act, is really about. The United States has struggled with this question for over 100 years. And I won't read off this slide, but you can see from Teddy Roosevelt through Bill Clinton, Democratic and Republican governor, uh, presidents have struggled to bring forward legislation. They, each of these people proposed legislation to uh, uh, ensure universal national health care coverage, going back to the early 1900s. And uh, it, it really is a 100 years effort, over 100 years before Barack Obama was able to pass this legislation. So another piece of context was from 1909, 1901 to 2009, the medical profession was dead set against the concept of shared uh, cost uh, responsibility of universal health care coverage. When Harry Truman brought forward a, a landmark piece of legislation to provide really a single payer solution in the 1940s, the AMA spent more money than anyone had ever spent on a ad campaign to kill the legislation and succeeded. And the AMA really stood for uh, being against the idea of, of national health programs. They coined the term socialized medicine, which we're still hearing echoed from 1940s even through today. And what was remarkable about, one of the things remarkable about the Affordable Care Act is that for the first time in U.S. medical history, the medical profession came out strongly in favor of this legislation. It was a big turnaround. And so uh, as you're going through, the med medical students here going through training should know they're entering the profession at a historic uh, time of change. The professions behind this law, New England Gen Journal of Medicine calculates about 75 percent of doctors in support of the move towards universal health care coverage. So let's go through the basics, which, which is what we're uh, going to spend the rest of the time talking about. Care, cost, and quality. When it comes to care, there are about 42 million Americans before the law was passed. I, I can't believe I'm saying this is in the past now already. But it used to be there were 42 million people uncovered by insurance. 42,000 people a year died as a result of that, only died that year because they didn't have health insurance. So the first thing this law does, it establishes for the first time in American history, it settles the question whether we're going to be committed as a country to universal coverage, this law says, yes, the United States will join the ranks of all other advanced countries and say, if you are in this land, you will be covered by insurance. Land, that's probably the, one of the biggest steps forward taken by this law. So far, uh, that coverage is uh, so being extended uh, through two mechanisms, which we'll hear a lot more about from the other panelists, Medicaid expansion in particular, and exchanges. About half of the 42 million people who aren't covered will get coverage through exchanges, and half, if they make under 138 percent of federal poverty level, the other half will get through Medicaid expansion in states where that's available. So far, about 7 million people have signed up by exchange and Medicaid. So that 42 million number has already been chopped down a bit by 7 million because of this law. Those 7 million people would not have health insurance if uh, the law had not been passed. The other thing that's extraordinary about this law is it ends this really crazy concept of a pre-existing condition. When I got my first medical insurance package uh, some time ago, I was told I'm all set, I'm covered for everything but asthma. And I said, well, that's funny, that's the only thing I need it for. So uh, that, was the, that was the realm of the Kafka-esque concept of pre-existing condition. You were insured for everything except what you needed the insurance for. So that now is illegal as of January 1st of this year. Uh, it's a major achievement of the law in terms of care. This, uh, law also ends the concept that after a certain amount of expenditure, let's say you have a congenital heart defect or cancer or some other expensive condition, you, before this law was in place, might run out of coverage after you spent two to five million dollars. That's gone. This law also uh, provides pre preventive services and it ends the practice of rescission. How many people know what rescission is? It's not a surgery. Uh, so, well, this is sort of a financial surgery. Rescission said that, okay, I got my policy. The only thing I'm excluded from is what I had when I signed up for the insurance, in my case, asthma. But tomorrow I develop um, rheumatoid arthritis. And um, my carrier says, oh, well, now that you've developed this, we're going to kick you off our plan. We don't 
we don't, we're not going to help you with that. So there were thousands of people kicked off every year from insurance when they developed a disease that required coverage, even if they paid premiums into the system for 20 or 30 years. That's now illegal as well. So around the issues of, of care, uh, there's a revolution in the United States about what it means uh, to have access to care because of this law. Second topic that the uh, law addresses is cost. And um, what we found is there's a lot of controversy about whether this law really had provisions and teeth in it to really knock down the amount of, uh, that, that we spend in the United States. My own reading of the cost uh, issue from uh, the literature is that uh, the United States charges more for things than, you know, medicines, hospital admissions, surgeries, et cetera, than any other country in the world. So an albuterol inhaler in the United States costs $120 to get right now. If you go a few miles north of Lake Erie, it's $7. And it's illegal for me to go to Canada to get that $7 inhaler. And it's illegal for uh, me to write a prescription for someone to go get it in Canada. So we've got, the law doesn't really address that cost inflation. However, there are provisions in it, and I don't have time to go into the details, that do tame the rate of rise. And we've seen, in fact, since uh, the law has been passed, a slowdown, the greatest slowdown in the rise in the cost of health uh, services in the United States in decades. So we are seeing an impact from this law in overall costs. There is a statute in the law that limits the amount that insurance company can increase premiums. Premiums used to rise 20, 30 percent a year. Now there's a cap on how rapidly the uh, premium can rise year to year. It's now illegal for, that's in the next slide actually, it's illegal for the uh, any company to charge women more than men uh, for the same uh, level of coverage. This is a very important point. Um, Medicare and Medicaid right now, uh, their overhead costs are about 3 percent of, of, of expenditure. It used to be that uh, insurance companies ran about 20 to 30 percent. So if you paid a premium of $100 a month, 20 to $30 of that premium went to the uh, executives and other staff of the company. And now by law, uh, they can only um, put 20 percent towards uh, overhead, and it's going down 15 percent. Uncovered people cost people, the other, everyone in the United States, money. It's estimated about $1,000. Each of us in this room, we're spending about $1,000 a year paying for ER visits for people without coverage, and those costs are going to go away with this bill. Let third and final piece of the basics I'll go over with you is a very important point, <clears throat> two points really about quality. Believe it or not, in the medical industry in the United States, you don't really have a terrific amount of pressure to make sure that something works or that uh, you're paying for good results, not services. What I mean by making sure something works, what I really mean is for the money. So in cancer therapies, there's a wide range of services available, some of which uh, have um, many orders of magnitude difference in cost and yet no difference in outcome. So you could have a treatment that may cost $200,000 per treatment versus a treatment that costs $1,000 a treatment and no difference in outcome. So the question is why are we spending several orders of magnitude more for the same outcome? We don't really have a good way to um, document that or to uh, f actually lead to management of decisions based on good cost uh, for benefit outcome. This law has agencies that are created that allow us for the first time to really measure what the outcome for the cost that we're spending of what we do actually uh, achieves. And, s and the other thing that uh, the law has is something called accountable care organizations, which are meant to be uh, laboratories of innovation that then also are compensated for improved outcomes. So the idea is if I take care of a thousand people with diabetes and my average hemoglobin A1C levels or the level of control are superior, I would actually get paid more for taking care of a thousand people whose diabetes are better managed versus being paid for each visit. So we're moving away from being paid for every time you do something to actually having a healthier pop population. It's the first time in American history that any statute has been put in place to move in that direction. So care, cost, and quality are major provisions of this law. We believe that the law will lead to fewer people dying as a result of illness. We believe that we'll see fewer bankruptcies in the United States. I think these are two pretty powerful benefits from any law. Um, it's the end of pre-existing conditions. 105 million people have been lifted off of lifetime caps already. 
the cost through this, uh, uh, pr uh, these provisions through 2022 is about $1 trillion, but the savings are $710 billion in Medicare, none of which were a restriction of benefits. These are savings in terms of better management of provision of, of services only. Fees to hospitals, manufacturers, insurers uh, raise another $569 billion. So the net cost through 2022 of all these things I talked about in terms of universal care, decreased cost, improved quality, the cost is actually a savings. We're going to insure everyone in the country. We're going to bring down the cost of health care. We're going to establish actual quality of standards. And we're actually going to spend less money as a result of those things. 20 million people actually get a tax cut as a result of this law. And it's estimated about $2,500 per year will be saved per family. And for the first time in U.S. history, as I mentioned before, I'll conclude here, no one in the United States, once this law is fully put into practice, no longer will anyone in the United States die for lack of insurance. And the first time will slow down the costs of uh, increased costs. And um, the work that we do will be defined by the quality that we produce. And hopefully we get paid as a result of that scale rather than just because of the number of things that we actually do. So we're very uh, excited about the uh, law. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Medicaid. Well, oh, that's the next slide anyway, next presentation anyway. So uh, thank you for your attention. Again, please do sign up for this uh, Doctors for uh, Healthcare Solutions. We're looking for people who are interested in helping us design websites, connect to other doctors in the uh, area. Um, we do a lot of exciting things. We like, we'd love to have you join us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doctor, and thanks, Tori, and the case folks for inviting me. Um, Lauren Anthes, I work at Metro Health. I am a lobbyist for the hospital, and if you didn't think that was terrible enough, I, my lobbyist badge is actually a selfie picture. <laughs> so, so that's two strikes against me, so hopefully just, you know, give me some mercy as I go through this. Okay, so I wanted to talk about Medicaid expansion. Uh, just to raise a hand, who understands the difference between Medicaid and Medicare? All right, cool. Um, what I want to do is just talk about why Medicaid expansion matters in the context of healthcare reform, uh, what it is, why expansion is important, and whether or not it works. Um, at Metro Health, we had a waiver that mirrored a lot of what Medicaid expansion did. And uh, last Friday, Better Health Greater Cleveland, uh, Dr. Andy Siebel, who's associated with us, and in case made a presentation um, on some of the results that uh, I think were pretty encouraging. But before we get to that, so why does it matter? So he was talking about uh, the triple aim essentially, and I think it's 2008 Donald Berwick, who was the administrator for the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, basically said healthcare needs to do this. And you know, I'm currently going through my uh, healthcare masters of business, so I'm, I'm used to a lot of like diagrams and words like synergy lately, but it, it really does capture a lot of, uh, of what is trying to be accomplished through healthcare reform and where the real seismic shift has to uh, take place. And what it does is it talks about the issue of care, making sure that care is a primary tenant of healthcare delivery systems, uh, that populations uh, have access, there's equity, which is um, not very common in the United States, if, if, if you really want to be honest about it and that you get the best value for the healthcare system resources. And I would argue that value, the cost, is probably what drove most of these conversations from pro a political standpoint. If I'm um, hearkening back to the philosopher's Wu-Tang Clan, uh, cash rules everything around me, and <laughs> I think that's also true of most politicians. So, uh, And speaking of politicians, important people saying stuff. Um, so. Uh, feel free to read that. Um, essentially, you know, you look at the president, he talks about inflation. If you look at Kathleen Sebelius, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, also related to a former governor of Ohio, interestingly enough, um, talking about now is the time to kind of take the plunge. If anything, the ACA was kind of a kick over the hill. Some people don't like the kick, some people don't like the hill, some people thought we didn't need to go over. She said we just needed to do something. Greg Moody, who's the director of the Ohio Office of Health Transformation, Ohio is a Republican state. Uh, all statewide offices in the legislature are controlled by Republicans. He uh, worked with uh, Governor Kasich when he was the uh, chairman of the Finance Committee in Congress, and he is sort of, you know, king 
of the healthcare policy world, a very bright guy, very accessible guy, no nonsense. If, if you're going to go lobby him, you better know what you're talking about because he probably knows what you're going to say before you do. Uh, and he's basically saying, hey, listen, we have to start lining up our expectations. We need to think of healthcare and our ability to purchase healthcare as the Medicaid um, sort of, you know, agency uh, in a way to leverage system reform. And that's not to say that he agrees with everything in the Affordable Care Act, but rather to say that there are tools in the tool belt now that can leverage the power of, of policy options in Medicaid. Uh, and then the Medicaid director, John McCarthy, talking about the cost here. $17 billion per year to provide health care for more than 2.7 million people. 2.7 million people in the state of Ohio are on Medicaid. Half of all births in the state of Ohio are paid for by the Medicaid program. So if you want to talk about how it's integral to life, uh, for many infants, I would say that it's a necessary component, at least for half of them. Um, and while we're spending that much, most of, the, most of the cost doesn't really lie with most of the beneficiaries. There's a, there's a segment of folks who cost more than other folks. And that's where we get into you know, the idea of risk, whether it's insurance or Medicaid, and how the state can get involved. So um, now I appreciate how great of a doctor the doctor might be in all the professional uh, achievements that you may be able to attain. Uh, not to say that healthcare is bad in the US, but it is. And the reason is, uh, <laughs> it just costs a lot of money. And why is that? Why does it cost so much money? And I, I'm going to let you know, this is from Kaiser Family Foundation, and I steal. I just blatantly steal slides from them <laughs> and from the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. Um, I'm a lobbyist. It's what I do. So um, I, it, you know, with, with the United States here and this cost, I mean, it's, it's important to see. Look at all these other countries. You know, Canada, 4,000 some, 7,910. That's, that's incredible. And so something has to change. And whether you're on the right or left side of the spectrum of health care, uh, you know, or healthcare politics, everyone agrees this is pretty bad. And so this gets into the other conversation. So, so where is the spending happening? Okay, five percent, five percent account for fifty-five percent of the cost. Why is that? It's because there isn't coordination taking place. It's because people don't have access. It's because if you're someone with diabetes in this country and you don't have insurance. You don't see a doctor until you basically need an amputation, or you go to the ER room and you need imaging done, and that has a cost. And that cost gets deferred to other people who do have insurance. And that quick care isn't coordinated. It gets into things like behavioral health. So for you social workers out there, you know, when, you, when you're doing your CPST treatment, when you're out in the community and you're taking those folks with severe mental illness to the grocery store and doing those sorts of things, how many times do you actually connect back with the primary care physician and say, Here's what happened today. Here are their behavioral health issues. Let me know what happens you know, on the primary care side so that I can coordinate those things as a social worker to achieve the greatest success. And in fact, Ohio is pursuing a project specifically tailored to that because for persons with severe mental illness and Medicaid, they're 10% of the population, but 26% of the cost. And that cost is because of physical health care issues. It's not because of their mental illness. Mental illness doesn't just suddenly you know, cause disease, it's because there isn't coordination because they're not accessing the primary care system. And a great majority of those folks, I think a, a quarter of them, or a minority, but a, a large number are, are uninsured or traditionally uninsured. Um, so Ohio versus the U.S., why this matters to us. So Greg Moody, Governor's Office of Health Transformation, this is through 2010. Basically, we're expensive, and we're more expensive even when compared to how bad the United States is doing. Uh, our folks use the emergency uh, department more often. We encourage a system to build emergency departments as opposed to primary care offices. We encourage our medical students to become specialists and not primary care doctors. Why is that? That's where you make money. That's, that's how it is. So back to the Wu-Tang reference. <laughs> so Ohio and payment reform. So wh where is this going? So if you talk about the history of health care and you talk about the development of insurance from Blue Cross Blue Shield and Texas and California all through today, you're talking about a system that essentially started with when you come to me and you have a particular service that you need done, we're going to pay for that service. That is the fee-for-service system. Where it's going and where it's going generally in the state of Ohio and um, as health care reforms, whether you're talking about accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes, is global payments. So let's focus in on a population. Let's say, okay, everyone who has severe mental illness we know costs 26% of the Medicaid dollar. Let's say 
okay, how much does that cost to coordinate not only their mental health care, but all of their physical health care needs? And then let's turn that into one payment reviewed by an actuary who says, okay, for every month, we're going to give you 500 bucks. And our expectation is that you achieve health care outcomes, and when you do, we're going to pay you extra. And if you don't and you're unsuccessful, you're going to eat the cost. So it encourages success, and that's where things are going. The idea that once people have coverage, you change the payment system to say, no, we're going to pay you based off of success. We're going to pay you off of the successful management of individuals. So what is Medicaid expansion, and why does it matter to this conversation? So this is current Medicaid eligibility. These are the 2.7 million people. You got children who are eligible up to 200% of the federal poverty limit, which uh, after the revised amounts, I think it's like $20,000 a year or something like that. Uh, pregnant women, same thing. Which, by the way, I don't know, after you have a child, you're no longer pregnant. So traditionally, you were no longer eligible for Medicaid. And uh, I have four sisters, and I will tell you they had a lot of health care needs associated with not only their children but themselves after they had their children. So it's the idea that they'd suddenly lose their doctor ability to see their doctor regularly um, is, a, is a big deal. And it also gets into other sort of public health issues like infant mortality or success with like children generally with their health care or even educational outcomes. Uh, parents, 90% of the federal poverty limit. So if you were a parent and you were very poor and your child was eligible for Medicaid, if you made 91% of the federal poverty limit, so $9,000 a year or something like that, you weren't eligible for the Medicaid program. You got no health care coverage. Uh, childless adults, this is really where Medicaid expansion is, and we'll see that in a second. Basically, if you're an adult between 18 and 64 and you have no kids, sorry. Uh, disabled workers, uh, this is a relatively small program, but if you're disabled, uh, there are certain rules, things that allow you access to the system. For disabled individuals, oftentimes a uh, mixture of Social Security and Medicare help cover a lot of your costs, but Medicaid is sort of a wraparound from a payment standpoint. But oftentimes, individuals have to spend down, essentially, into a poverty level in order to get coverage. So you have to pay for health care first out of pocket before you're allowed to get Medicaid. So what does this look like with Medicaid expansion? Basically, everybody is covered from zero to 400% of the federal poverty limit. And here, the, you see the exchange. That goes to 138. So this is everybody who's in the exchange. This is where the gaps are. And to kind of illustrate it a little bit more, this is what it would be like without Medicaid expansion. Th these are the folks who are in Medicaid expansion. So the disabled, childless adults, parents. And childless adults can include the severely mentally ill, like we discussed, other people who are in incredibly poor parents who make uh, above $9,000 a year. So why, why do it? Um, number one, it's cheap, so to speak, from a state policy perspective. Most of the money, at least in the first three years, comes from the federal government. The federal government completely subsidizes these individuals. And then it sort of slides down to a certain amount. And traditionally, Medicaid, for every dollar that gets spent in the Medicaid program, there's a match. Uh, it can't go below 50% based off of the Social Security Act, Title 19, blah, 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 blah. Um, in Ohio, it's around 64% based off of our information demographically about how poor we are as a state, employment levels, things like that. So traditional Medicaid, for every dollar we spend on Medicaid, 64 cents actually comes from the federal government. In the context of newly Medicaid eligible, this is the percentage share of the federal government. So it doesn't dip below 90 cents of those dollars. Overall impact, I don't want you to read this. I just want to make a point here. Um, the net impact of this, uh, the Urban Institute and Ohio State University did a study of what this would do in terms of cost benefit, and this was a neutral report while lobbying was happening around Medicaid expansion. Because, this, uh, and let me backtrack for a second, the Supreme Court decision that came a couple years ago basically left this option of Medicaid expansion to the states. About 26 states, I think, 26 have decided to uh, opt for Medicaid expansion, 24 have not yet. But we were trying to make the argument to the state government that they should. And I'm going to tell you it was difficult because most of the people ran against the Affordable Care Act who are currently in public office. So we had to explain to them, not in terms of ethics, morality, health care, all those other you know, nonsensical things, but <laughs> the idea of cost, why this, why this makes sense for them. And bottom line is that over the course of the expansion, they would net a fiscal gain of about $1.8 billion. Uh, over that term. And they would also achieve a number of savings because there's, a, there's 150 categorical eligibility groups in Medicaid, including breast cancer, cervical cancer, inpatient prison costs, retroactive and other pre, uh, managed care costs. All that sort of stuff 
basically gets wiped away because it makes it more simple because now there's a payer identified, so you don't have to create all these programs. Um, an idea of what this means in Ohio. So this is how many people would be uninsured in the state of Ohio without uh, the Affordable Care Act. This is the number of uninsured in Ohio without Medicaid expansion. And this is what happens with expansion. There are still people who will not have some sort of coverage. And that will because, be because maybe they're not US citizens. Maybe they just don't care and they don't want to get insurance. They're, it's kind of a complex equation. But for example, even with our waiver where we covered people, we saw an increase in uninsured at Metro Health. So advocacy. This lady is, she's cool. She was nice. Um, and she was also very loud, which was good. Um, this is the steps of the State House. Uh, and there's a lot of people on a rainy day advocating for this, and that's, I think, Bob, Nami, uh, Bob um, Spada from NAMI, a former state senator Republican who now uh, works with the National Association for Mental Illness, um, talking about how this would impact particularly those with behavioral health issues. And everyone just basically saying this is a good idea, um, the idea that it, there was a pervasive sort of narrative in the state house that people on Medicaid or people that would be on Medicaid don't work, aren't interested in employment, that um, you will, once you give someone this benefit, there's no incentive for them to work. Um, this was to counteract that message. Um, in the uh, Care Plus program, for example, about 40% of the people we saw who didn't have insurance, who got insurance through Metro Health Care Plus, were actually working. Uh, to give you an example, there was a, a mother of three who was working as a um, uh, as a, a maid doing like you know cleaning services on a contract basis, she was splitting diabetes medication with her grandmother because her grandmother had Medicare and she didn't. She had three kids and she was at like I think 95 percent of the federal poverty limit, so she's in that gap. She ended up coming to Metro and having both of her legs amputated. So you know, and it's not like she didn't want to work. She was working. She was working as hard as she could. She had the three kids, and now the only time she comes to our system is when there's an emergent issue. Um, so the, you know, the, the advocacy process was explaining that story, that, you know, uh, that there's a number of benefits to this transactionally and interpersonally that matter. Uh, so the question, does it work? OK, so Care Plus, um, this is the question we had to answer as a part of our agreement with the federal government. And after 10 months, you know, would we have better care for outcomes in blood pressure and diabetes as compared to the insurance? I didn't have the, the charts available because I wasn't sure if I could publish. Uh, that information. But um, last Friday, and I think Better Health Greater Cleveland, if you're interested, and you can just Google them or go to betterhealthgreatercleveland.com, uh, published it. In fact, yeah, there were significant, sti statistically significant gains for the 28,200 people that we were able to enroll in both, both blood pressure and diabetes control. And what that means long term for everybody is these are people who don't have to come to the ER room to get their legs amputated. These are people who won't have, uh, you know, the medicalized stents put in their hearts because they weren't able to manage their heart conditions. Um, and that defers costs away from private insurance. And honestly, for an institution like Metro Health, where half of our business is either Medicaid or uninsured, we can put those resources back into delivering better care um, and possibly paying our doctors better. We're accepting applications. <laughs> um, so a couple of people, we interviewed some folks uh, in, in a part of this. And this, this guy, Lewis, uh, is a really interesting guy. He was a carpenter. And he came to, to us uh, like two months after the program started. And he had this, these very serious heart issues. He wasn't able to afford the procedure. And because it wasn't uh, considered emergent, he wasn't eligible until basically he had, you know, uh, he had to go to the ER room. So he had been waiting. He lost 110 pounds just to try to control his own health care. And then he was able to get on Care Plus. He had his heart issue fixed. And now he's back being a carpenter. Um, Nilda, she, uh, uh, Puerto Rican woman, fantastic, had her grandson there. Uh, she had been holding on to a surgery for over a year, you know, just waiting for some sort of level of coverage because she couldn't afford it. She just said, I can't, I can't do that. I'm taking care of my grandson. I work full time. I don't have the resources to do it. She had c coverage through Care Plus, and now she was able to get her surgery. So. Um, I know that Sarah's about to start, but that's essentially the idea here. It, coverage is an important component because honestly, think about like Costco. Why is Costco cheap? It's because of the economies of scale question. Healthcare is the same way. You're once working with a specialized sort of focused industry, 
that relied on a fee-for-service payment structure. In order to pay for outcomes, you need the volume of people to come in to do true population management, and that's what Medicaid expansion essentially does for you. So. Is that bad, huh? Okay. Sure. I can. Well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan. I'm with a social worker with the Diabetes Partnership of Cleveland. And my question is spend down on Medicaid. When I get the calls come in, they say, I really don't have any insurance because I have a spend down of $3,000 and I can't get my strips and I can't get my diabetic supplies. Right. Um, I really don't have insurance, Susan. Tell me about spend down. Uh, generally? Um, generally. Well, well, I think Medicaid expansion actually eliminates um, the spend down category, or at least it will in the future. So um, for those individuals who wouldn't qualify income wise, they're able to to enroll into this new group of people. I think, I think that's the case, but that's probably a question. That's ideally how it is supposed to work. We have not yet gotten far enough into the system to see if that is in fact what is gonna happen with those whose income requires them to fall into, had required them to fall into the spend down category. Um, spend, I mean, spend down is incredibly complicated and it's difficult for people because really it's you know capturing what little bit of income that they do have available or what little bit of money they have available and applying it to their medical costs. All righty, I'm going to squeeze right out here. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Hockenbrock with the Cuyahoga Health Access Partnership. And we are a local private nonprofit. And we've been working in this community for um, about two and a half years. So when CHAP was formed and developed by our partner organizations, which include the four major hospital systems here in Cuyahoga County, including Metro Health, we work with the federally qualified health centers in this region as well to provide primary care services. And at that time, the county commissioner structure and local government came to all of these fantastic health care providers that you guys will probably be going into in this community and said, yeah, you guys are great, but we've got a serious problem here. We have our own constituents, residents of our own local wards and communities that don't actually get to get access to your services until they wait till something in an emergent condition and show up at Metro Health's emergency department or somewhere else in the community because they've had to wait so long because they haven't been able to get consistent access to primary care. And so that was really what CHAP was formed to help our community members do was develop the relationship with people who are uninsured, people who are county residents from 19 to 64, those childless adults that Lauren was showing you on his chart were really the population that we were trying to work with to say, you know what, you haven't been able to get consistent access to care, but let's show you how we can do that and not charge you um, while there wasn't a payment mechanism in place for those folks. And so what we did with them is got them connected to one of the locally federally qualified health centers or one of the free clinics in town and then when they needed to go on for specialty care, we basically conducted a shared community rating process that let them move on for hospitalization or specialty care without going through that financial clearance interview all over again, but then reinforced the mechanism to get them back to that federally qualified health center or primary care point of care so they had that medical home concept and it helped instill that behavior. And when they needed to be redetermined or re-rated through our shared community system, instead of letting them go wherever they wanted, we had a, a reminder card mechanism and follow-up mechanism that helped say, you know what, you need to be redetermined. If you want to keep receiving this care or if information in your, in your family status or income has changed, you need to go get redetermined. And by the way, is this a good time? Do you need to get a checkup for anything? Is there anything wrong that you might need to see a regular doctor for? And it started to change their behaviors. And so that just really tells you, our mission as an organization in Cuyahoga County has been to transform this region into a model of health and wellness for the uninsured adult population by connecting individuals to access to care. And for us, the Affordable Care Act is something, you know, we, I get the question a lot of times, well, 
you guys aren't even needed anymore. What's what's CHAP going to do? Well, for us, it's allowing us to think even bigger and broader beyond our initial mission um, and, and the original charge, which was just connecting people to the service providers in this community. We now have the ability to actually connect pe people to coverage tools and payment options so that they can actually get access to full benefits. They can get their prescriptions filled when they need to go on to um, meet with a specialist and that doctor gives them a prescription that they would never have been able to afford. We have Adrian Price here with MedRefer and United Way 211. Um, we could connect patients to Adrian and sometimes they, she would be able to help them get low cost prescriptions. But other times we would have to send somebody back to their primary care doctor or their specialist to say, is there another medication that this person could use because there's simply no way they can follow your instructions and afford this medication and pay their rent. Um, and so this is the population that we've been working with will greatly benefit from the expansion of Medicaid, but also should benefit from the expansion with the um, health insurance marketplace. And so this is a little bit of the access plan that I was telling you about. Again, these were for individuals who are 19 to 64 years old and Cuyahoga County residents. They would be able to go in and choose a primary care provider. It was very much location-based and where individuals were comfortable going. So if somebody lived over here on the west side or on the east side and they had been to the free clinic before, but it had been a while and they weren't sure about going back, then we could offer them another option and maybe some one of the locations at Northeast Ohio Neighborhood Health Services would be a good fit for them as well. And so it was about, about looking for what the options were that best fit that individual's personal situation and preferences. And that allowed them to then move on through the healthcare system. Throughout this process, we've touched nearly 3,000 people of just connecting them to services. Um, and with our hospital partners assistance, we've provided over 3,200 specialty care appointments, which for us has told us through this entire process that once you get somebody into the healthcare system, it's not a one-time touch and they're done. They keep going back to their primary care partners and when they get access to the specialty care services, our hospitals in this community and all of you as future doctors do a great job of identifying, you know what, Mr. Jones, it's great that you're here for your cardiologist appointment, but I'm seeing something else and I need you to make another appointment because I want, there's something here that we want for you to get checked out. And at no point in time were these patients left wandering throughout the system. Um, they had great response teams within their primary care support staff and also had access to our staff if in fact they did receive a bill for something or if they had questions or concerns about how to use the healthcare system. Um, we had one of our staff members who was a trained financial counselor had spent 20 years working in the hospital system and could help them understand what options were available to them as they went through the entire process um, of getting access to primary and then specialty care. And so now, as Lauren told you about the Medicaid expansion, the secondary piece of the Affordable Care Act that expands access to coverage is the health insurance marketplace. This is what gives people who have never had the opportunity or the ability to purchase insurance on their own without the assistance of an agent and broker to go on to an online source and do that or to work with somebody in a one-on-one -on -one situation and help select a plan that is going to be the best fit for them. And again, as we talk about the Affordable Care Act, it's so important to recognize that what we said is that this applies to everyone. Everyone is expected to have health insurance coverage. You might get that through your employer. You might get that through the expansion of Medicaid. You might be covered under Medicare. But if none of those options are available to you, you now have the health insurance marketplace to take a look at and see what you can shop for and compare. As you know, healthcare.gov is the website that we are using here in the state of Ohio. We're using a federally facilitated marketplace, which means that this system is being run by the federal government. And so all the reports that you were hearing in October and November about the site not being functional, there were challenges. Absolutely, the federal government recognized that. We as navigators on the ground also ran into challenges. But starting in December, things changed dramatically, and the technical functionality of the website improved dramatically. And we actually have had such success that um, in this region, about a week and a half ago, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius came and joined Mayor Jackson for a press conference to talk about healthcare.gov and remind people that they have until March 31st to enroll 
And we had the fortunate ability of one of our navigators getting to share her story of being a navigator and what that means to her and how her, her own experiences has led her to be able to share her story with other people who need her assistance. And she makes a great personal connection with folks whenever they're sitting down and asking her for assistance. And so really what the marketplace lets people do is go on and shop for coverage and compare plans in an apples to apples comparison. So previously, when you would purchase health insurance on your own, you would be looking at plans, but you would have to dig down all the way into the details to make sure that you were actually comparing plans that had all the exact same components within them. Um, and so particularly for women, if you were comparing plans, even as an employer, if you were working with an agent and broker, and you wanted to make sure that your employees had maternity coverage and health benefits specifically for women, or didn't include certain aspects, you would need to dig all the way down into the details to make sure that the plans you were looking at were the exact same, and so therefore the cost that you were comparing for those plans was an accurate comparison. Because what would happen is that you would look at a health insurance plan and say, well, this one's much cheaper. I'm just going to go with the cheapest option. This fits my budget. But then you would get yourself into a situation when you didn't have the actual coverage that you needed for your specific conditions. And what has happened in order to allow this safe comparison is that each of the plans that are now being sold on the health insurance marketplace have to be approved and certified as qualified health plans. And that means that they have the same 10 essential health benefits um, throughout each plan. They're just covered in different scopes. So for the marketplace eligibility, it's very important that with, since we are a federally facilitated marketplace, as Lauren was saying, ideally, the Affordable Care Act opens up coverage for everyone, but you still have to be a US citizen. And so that's one of the pieces where we recognize as a local access plan, working with our local provider partners, there are still going to be a significant portion of our population who are undocumented that will not qualify for Medicaid expansion or the marketplace. Um, so as you're talking with people in your own relationships, if you're volunteering somewhere, if you are doing hours at the student-run free clinic, make sure that you understand where someone's coming from or maybe what their family situation might be to help understand exactly what might be the best option for them, be it Medicaid, be it the health insurance marketplace, or be it a local health access op option with one of our community partners. And these are the 10 essential health benefits that are going to be available in each plan. They're, you know, they're included in every plan, but based on the amount that you're paying for the plan and the amount of coverage provided, you may receive um, more mental and health and substance abuse options in one plan than what you would receive in others. So that means in some plans you might get 10 visits, where in other plans you might have 20 or 30 or unlimited visits. And that's where for each individual person, the same plan that's going to be that's going to work for myself and my family might be very different than what works for Lauren or what works for any of you and and or your parents. Think of it if you think of it generationally, what you need in a health plan is completely different than what your parents are unless your parents are much healthier and robust and doing better than mine. <laughs> my folks, you know, there are certain parts of this that I'd want to make sure we do, some, you know, let's get some of that preventative wellness going guys so that you can get out and do some exercises. And this is where we talk about the metal level of coverage in talking about making sure that the choice is available to the consumers and that consumers can choose a plan based on what fits their own health needs, but then what they can actually afford and fit into their budget. And that allows them to really make sure that they're choosing a plan that has either the robust coverage that they need, particularly if they have a larger medical issue that they need to be prepared for, or they can scale back and choose a bronze level plan if they know that they're relatively healthy, but they just need to make sure they have insurance in case something were to go wrong. But what's important to look at is the silver level of coverage across the board to make insurance more affordable. There have been two mechanisms put in place for people to be able to afford the plans that are available to them on the marketplace. So again, we're talking about the population from 100 to 400% of federal poverty. So that could mean a family of four up to $92,000 based on the 2013 rates uh, for federal poverty. I haven't gotten the new 2014 stats fully committed to memory. And so for the financial services and help available, 
There are tax credits to help lower the amount um, that someone would pay out of pocket for a premium. And a premium is basically the exact same thing that you already pay with your car insurance. You pay that monthly bill just to make sure that you have your car insurance and you've got that little card in your, hopefully in your glove box so that when you get pulled over and they ask you, <laughs> yes, here is my active and, and valid insurance. That's really what your premium allows you to do is say, yep, here's my medical mutual card or here is my care source card. Then the second component is the reduced cost sharing to lower the out-of-pocket cost. Those are all the things that you're accustomed to paying when you go to the doctor's office. How many, I'm guessing most of you in, in the room have grown up with using insurance, and so you know that experience of going in, and every time you go to a new doctor's office or you go back for a visit, is your insurance information the sh is the same? If not, you present your new card and they copy that and keep it on file. Uh, all of those out-of-pocket costs are typically listed on the back of, of your card or there's a number that you can call to get that information. Um, for some people, this is a very new experience. Again, these are the folks that have been walking into the emergency department at Metro or UH or the Cleveland Clinic or Sisters of Charity, and they've just had to pay whatever has, they've been told is the total amount of service and then oftentimes ask for financial assistance to either get enrolled in a charity year program or get on a payment plan to cover those. So the advanced premium tax credit is what lowers the cost of your insurance. This is for individuals who obtain coverage on the marketplace and they can't be eligible for Medicaid or Medicare or any of the other government programs. So for someone whose income is between 100 and 400% of federal poverty level, they can look at the plans and compare them on their own and see what their subsidy calculation will be or they can sit down with an in-person assister and compare those options. For the advanced premium tax credit, it is based on the projected household income of that individual and their family. So it's very important that when we have navigators and community assisters working with people, that we're getting the full picture. They come in with either last year's tax filing information or current paycheck stubs or W-2s so that we know exactly what their annual household income is going to be and the household that they're trying to insure because we want to make sure that we get them the right level of subsidy calculation, not too high, not too low, because ultimately that ends up being, um, that's a situation where if you give somebody too much of a subsidy, they might end up having to pay some of that back. Or if they don't get a high enough subsidy, then the care is still not going to be affordable to them and they're going to say, mm. I really can't afford to do this. For cost sharing, if someone chooses a silver level plan, again, this is where it gets back into choosing a plan on the marketplace and a silver level plan, they're also going to be eligible for reduced cost sharing to make what that care costs out of pocket more affordable. So for individuals who are at 250% of federal poverty, that is available to them as a secondary mechanism to reduce their cost. For young people, this may be very applicable, not necessarily to all of you, but you may have cousins or roommates or friends who don't have insurance currently that would benefit from the knowledge of a catastrophic plan. I think this might be something that Young Invincibles talks about a little bit more in detail, so I'm gonna save that for him, but this is still an option, especially for young people who really just need some coverage right now um, in case of some type of emergency situation. And so here in the local community, we have actually a number of resources available to help people and help the individuals that you, you run into if you're treating them or working with them in the free clinic or doing volunteer service hours elsewhere in the community. You don't have to necessarily know everything that we've talked about today, but we want to make sure that you know that there are resources available for the folks that you're talking to on a regular basis and that there's a mechanism for you to get connected. Um, the first most important thing that we have been able to do regionally, I don't have a slide dedicated, dedicated to it yet because it's very new, but we've been able to coordinate with United Way 211. So Diane and Adrian are here, and I think they're gonna be sticking around later today. They are running the United Way 211 first call for help service here in this region. And we have coordinated as an entire group, basically of in-person assisters to make sure that 211 has all of our information regularly updated in terms of the hours, where navigators and in-person assisters are working, what events are we staffing out in the community, so that you can go on 211cleveland.org 
or have someone call 211 and they will be able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So no matter when you run into somebody that might need services, they have trained staff available to take their call and ask them about their health care needs, but also ask them, do you have trouble paying your rent? Have you had your heat shut off? Do you need access to food assistance? Their staff can take them through an entire broad-based set of questions that are dedicated not only to health insurance and, and services for health coverage, but a number of other situations that people who are challenged with health access may also be facing. And so for the in-person assistance, these are some of the organizations and, and the types of people that are out there in the, in the local communities. Um, this is just some basic information saying, ultimately from in rural America, that people don't know what options are available to them and they don't know that there is help to make the best choice for what they need. So in Ohio, we have a number of organizations that are known as navigators. And navigators are the federally funded assisters that are operating in the local community. And they're able to call themselves navigators because they receive federal grant dollars and they go through 20 hours of training with the state and then they have to be certified to perform their navigator duties. They have to know all of the qualified health plans and be able to provide guidance in a fair, balanced, and completely impartial manner. So that if we have somebody who asks us a question that just says, oh, this is too complicated, I don't want to make this decision myself, what should I do? We instead ask them the questions back to say, well, let's look at what your current health concerns are. We don't direct anybody to choose a particular plan. We help guide the consumer to make the best choice for him or herself. And oftentimes, this takes more than one interaction. This is, you know, we start with a one-hour interaction with the folks and then go on from there. Um, and we really work with people, no matter where they're coming from, whatever cultural sensibilities need to be addressed, whatever linguistic services needed to be provided, if there are physical uh, disabilities, we work with anybody to address those circumstances and provide them the service in a completely fair process. In addition to 211, statewide we have Ohio for Health, which is the website that has been stood up by our grantee partner, um, the Ohio Association of Food Banks. And then locally, we have a number of certified application counselors providing in-person assistance as well. And a lot of times what we're finding is that community health centers, um, some hospitals can become certified uh, application counselors. They're gearing these services to, instead of doing broad outreach, to serve their own population in-house. So they're serving their current territory, their neighborhoods. Um, some churches are becoming certified application counselors to serve their own congregation. And it, it really helps that in-person assister relationship, and they know that they have someone that they know and trust um, that, may, that might look like you and sound like you and knows your background and where you've come from. Agents and brokers are also still very much out there, and this is still a viable opportunity for the agents and brokers who have seized on the ability to serve uh, the plans on the health insurance marketplace. What's important to remember is that agents and brokers still can get compensated for the services that they provide. And so in some instances, you may work with an agent and broker that won't present all of the plans available to you on the marketplace because he or she may not be certified to sell all of those plans. And so that is one of the pieces that we do caution people if they haven't worked with an agent and broker before, um, they might not want to start there. They might want to start with a certified application counselor or in-person assister. And then if we find that it's a very particular case in which an agent or broker services would be beneficial, then the navigators or certified application counselors can help make that link for them. And so in Ohio, we've got a number of regional councils and really the Northeast Ohio coordination that we've been working with 211 and the Mount Sinai Foundation, Metro, and all of our local community partners is really geared toward maximizing our ability to enroll people in the marketplace and Medicaid and view this as a long-term investment in the community. This isn't something, as, as we were talking about the numbers earlier, this isn't something that we're gonna get completely done by March 31st. 
this won't even be completed by the next open enrollment cycle. This is going to take a lot of coordination and activity on the local level going out into neighborhoods, community recreation centers and churches, and really going to people where they are in their own local communities to help them understand that there might be an option available for them. So, Brian, you're next. Hey guys, uh, my name is David Bransfield, and I am from a group called Young Invincibles, and we are based in DC. We're a national nonprofit, and our goal is to make sure that our generation, 18 to 34 year olds, are knowledgeable, um, educated, and ready to participate in the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so I'm a state outreach coordinator is my technical title, but I've also been a navigator for these past five months, based in DC, trying to find you guys, um, trying to find people like you who are in need of insurance. So it's college students, grad students, contractors whose jobs don't uh, offer benefits, bartenders, um, anyone who works in a restaurant generally does not have coverage. The idea is our generation needs to get involved and um, needs to be aware of the changes that are going to impact our lives. So what I wanted to talk more about today was how um, I approach all this, this was a ton of information, right? Um, <laughs> and it's really hard to process most of it. But what I want to talk about is how I approach this, how I talk about the Affordable Care Act when I'm talking to my peers, when I'm talking to um, other young people. As so the first thing I want to get out of the way, young people want insurance. Um, every time you read a story about young people and insurance, the question is, will young people sign up? It's a question you'll read every time you see an article about our generation. And the answer is yes. Gallup did a poll that said 68% of young people are planning to buy insurance this enrollment period. That doesn't mean they're all going to buy it, but that means a vast majority of us are intending to buy insurance. Young Invincibles did a poll. We polled a few hundred of our peers and asked, hey, you're, if you're uninsured, why is that? And of those hundreds of people, 5% said they don't want insurance. 95%, the overwhelming majority said they want insurance, but there are reasons why they can't have insurance. Their job doesn't offer it. They're unemployed. They can't afford insurance. They move a lot. It's the same reason we're not registered to vote. We're moving every six months, every year, and this is something that is geographically based. So there are legitimate reasons why our generation is underinsured, and we want to make sure that those people, the, our friends and peers who need insurance, have the information they need. Does that make sense? And it's working. So this is a graphic that uh, my friend Julian put together. Um, the White House retweeted this. It's <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> um, but it's working. So the insurance companies said their goal going in was to get one in three people who sign up on a marketplace to be under the age of 35. And we're there. We're, you know, we're a few percentage points short. But 30 <laughs> percent, yes. <laughs> um, w w this was good news. This was at January 15th. Um, and it said one in 30% th uh, of people who signed up on a marketplace so far are young. I mean, it means that this is working, that um, this isn't going away. The, whole, uh, the term is death spiral. If young, healthy people didn't sign up, prices would go up, less people would sign up, it would implode, right? This means it's not happening. I mean, Obamacare is here to stay. But there are major problems when it comes to addressing health insurance with our generation. And the main one is this awareness gap. It just straight up, I started this job nine months ago, and I, when I was hired, I knew nothing about health insurance. I, I was young, I was on my parents' plan, I didn't need to know, right? Most of us don't need to know anything about health insurance until we're buying for the first time, or we have to pay for the first time, right? So just overcoming that, un, it, it's just a lack of education. It's the same reason financial literacy and voter registration are like, big problems with our generation. We just don't know until we need to know. So it's addressing that. It's giving presentations like this and hearing from experts. It's from talking one-on-one -on -one with your friends. It's posting an interesting article on Facebook. It's making sure that we're proactive when we're talking about these issues, because this is the big issue right now. Um, this is going to affect everyone, like um, they already mentioned. And we need to know, that we need to be able to share this information freely with our friends. 
Um, yeah, this, this one down here is scary. 81% of people don't know uh, the March 31st deadline. March 31st, last day to buy, last day to buy insurance this year. Um, if you're going to like share one thing, it's that. Just March 31st. Um, okay, one, <laughs> one of these got taken off. But uh, th these are just um, basic messages that we use, you know, like broad messages that we use um, to influence risk takers. And so I, just a little background about my organization. So the term Young Invincibles was a derogatory term used by health insurance companies to refer to our generation. They said, we're young, we're invincible, we're not going to buy insurance. So they weren't going to cater to us anyway. Um, so the people, the grad students who started my organization back in 2009 were like, hey, we're going to take that term. We're going to give it new meaning. Young Invincibles are going to be people who take charge and make sure that they are insured. And, um, but risk takers, rather, are people who assume that since they didn't go to the doctor last year, they're not going to go to the doctor this year. And if you live your life with the assumption that you're not going to go to the doctor, health insurance is not you know, part of your life. You, there's no reason to make that monthly payment. But the fact is, everyone is going to go to the emergency room at some point. Um, our young people are the second most likely demographic after plus uh, 75 and older to go to the emergency room. You know, we break bones, we're stupid. <laughs> well, we're not stupid, but <laughs> we do break bones. Um, and the other, the other thing to mention is that it is a law. Um, starting January 1st, it is a law to have health insurance. Um, and there will be a fee, uh, a penalty, if you don't um, get insured. All right, so the main statistic that I take away from this are the fact that 67% of people who are uninsured are men. 40% of people who are uninsured are between the ages of 18 and 29. So like, you're looking at you know, the key demographic right now. But what that means is we, we need to figure out ways to talk to young men about insurance without it sounding like a lecture. Um, it, it's not, this is another thing you need to do or you'll get in trouble. It, it's, Health insurance is something that is a good financial assessment for all of us. We're all going to need health care at some point. We should be paying for insurance. And most of us won't be paying for insurance. If you're in school, if you're um, working at a bar, you're generally going to qualify for Medicaid. Um, but the people who influence young people, um, I mean, you guys know who you listen to. You listen to your mom. You listen to your friends. You might listen to John Stewart, <laughs> and you listen to your doctor. You know, I, on healthcare, these these are the people who influence our lives, and you will soon fit into two of these categories. I mean, maybe three some at some point. But um, like, be proactive. The fact that you're in this room listening to this lecture means that you are the exception. You are the people who are going to take time out of their day to get knowledgeable about important issues about health insurance. Be proactive for all those people who aren't. All those people who did not come here and who are not going to seek out help, if they see a post on Facebook, they're much more likely to read that and then come to a lecture. But that's how you get information. That's how we share information these days. We p share it with our friends. So be proactive. Um, so far, I've been talking about young people as if it's this monolithic block, as if all young people are the same. And we know that's not true. Um, we know that we're the most diverse generation in American history, um, and it's only going to get more so, which is great, but it means that you can't treat young people, you can't treat people as a block, you can't treat them as a demographic, which means that when I'm you know, talking to a contractor, I'm using a different message than when I'm talking to an unemployed high school dropout. You know, it, it's just a different message but you still focus on a few things. You focus on ease, so it's really easy to sign up now. The website's fixed. It takes half an hour to an hour before you see plans. You focus on the fact that it's a law. And you focus on the fact that it's affordable. Those are the three things. You, know, you need to do it, it's easy to do, and it's cheap to do. And be blunt with that, you know. <laughs> um, but, the people in this demographic, um, I, I don't know the demographics of Cleveland as well as I know the demographics of DC, but I can guess that young black men who are less likely to get educated are also less likely to have insurance. And so that's been our target. Our target has been 
talking to mothers and talking to young black men about insurance and about how they can get enrolled. Um, outreach to communities of color is, uh, we go through social groups. We, we go through the same organizations that they would get any other information. Um, so talking to churches, talking to community centers, and most importantly, oops, talking to mom. Uh, so enroll, just, uh, enroll America is like the big, one of the big players in this, right? And they just put millions of dollars into an ad campaign that is exactly this. Just targeting moms across the country and being like, hey, we know your son's uninsured. Go talk to him. <laughs> and so you're going to see these ads coming out because they just, they just released them and you're going to see them on TV. Um, but here, here's what I've found to be most important. The vast majority of these enrollments are going to happen in two places. They're going to happen in hospitals and health centers where you know, someone already needs care, so they're coming and they're enrolling on the spot. And they're going to happen in the privacy of your own home. Most people are going to sign up on their own. But we're not looking to enroll most people. We're looking to enroll everybody. And the most important thing you can remember is that you will not get a congregation of young uninsured people on your own. What you need to do is go to where they are. Figure out who your target is, the population that you want to speak to, and go figure out where they hang out. Go to the basketball court, go to the barber shop, go to the community college, bars. I, I've been enrolling so many bartenders. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Like They're already there. They're not going to seek this information out, but they need it. And once you get talking to them, they know they need it. Um, so make it simple. Make it keep those three messages in mind and go where they are. Um, and that's like my that's my main takeaway from five months of doing this so far. Um, and then it's it's figure out a good story. Like Lauren has the best story in the world um, with the diabetes patient. But figure out what your personal story is. You guys all have you, uh, someone in your life who doesn't have insurance or who needed insurance, use that story. Uh, make it personal. And um, yeah, insurance is kind of like a vague word. But when you talk about someone who got denied from the hospital, denied care, that makes it real. That, makes, that puts in people's mind that this could be me. And then social media. Um, I, don't know, I don't know where I read this, but if you post one thing on Facebook a day, no one will care. You know, no, no one will mind that you're spamming them. One a day. More than that, like, you can run into trouble. But if one day you put something about health insurance, you know what I mean? Like, you have seven days, throw something up. Same with if you have Twitter followers, props to you. But um, <laughs> you use that platform um, because your, your friends trust you. They're your friends. They, they believe what you say, or they don't, and they'll call you on it. But like, just be proactive with your social media. People read it. Um, this is our plug. So <laughs> my, my beautiful colleagues have been working for a long time on this app. Um, it's called Healthy Young America, if you want to look it up in the Play Store or the App Store, whatever. Um, basically, what it'll do, with, within the click of a button, it will show you your local doctors. It will tell you exactly how much you will pay for a plan. So you punch in like your uh, zip code, age, and income, and it'll tell you how much plans are in your area. And then it will, it has kind of a breakdown of the basic terms of health insurance. So it, I didn't know what a premium was. I didn't know what, co I, I, coinsurance still confuses me a little bit. But you know, like th there are a bunch of terms that go into this process that we are not naturally familiar with. So it gives succinct, basic definitions for what a premium, a deductible, a copay are. Um, so if, you, if that's something that interests you, a Healthy Young America app, um, check it out. And then, so I just want to, this, this campaign, um, the, the reason I'm here, it's part of our Healthy Young America campaign. So we, we know that this is a long-term goal, um, health care literacy in, amongst our generation. But we want to make sure that we spread the message that young people are hearing facts as opposed to politics when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. And so we've been giving these presentations and traveling the country. Um, and if you want to know more, please, please contact me. Um, this is my email down at the bottom. 
um, and I'll be here for questions and um, we're gonna run a workshop afterwards, but um, I'd love to see you there. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, David and Sarah and Lauren and Dr. Lavin. We really appreciate all of your great talks. Um, we're gonna take just a few questions now and then we're gonna have a, a workshop afterwards for people who wanna know a little bit more about what they can do, hands-on things that they can do to help patients they see at the Student Run Free Clinic or at CPCP or whatever your clinical experience may be um, and just advocating to your friends about getting enrolled. So please join us, thank you. Yeah, um, any questions? And we'll bring the microphones to you. Um, I had a question about um, whether the healthcare system that we currently have can withstand in the, this deluge of patients that we're going to have, because with you know more than 30 million people coming on to have healthcare, then there's more patients for all of us to take care of. So. I think the system as it's currently set up, the answer is basically no. Um, but there's a lot of ways to tackle that challenge. I think one, there's a regulatory thing that you, uh, regulatory things that you can do. So recently in the state of Ohio, APNs were able to prescribe Schedule II drugs. And that's a capacity issue. And you don't have to have physicians or higher licensed individuals doing relatively routine tasks that opens them up to do other things. Um, I think technologies like telemedicine and the regulation associated therein could also help. Um, you know, there's technologies that can track people's um, uh, glucose levels and blood pressure, and they can check in with doctors regularly, and they don't have to come to the office to do that. In fact, uh, Metro has something called the Health Spot, which is in the county um, uh, justice center at the basement, where all county employees who are insured through Metro Health Select can go in and speak to a doctor at any time that they would want. So that I think technology is going to define a lot of that. And I also think it's really important to think about education in all of this, because really the capacity issue is around how do we fulfill the need for primary care. If the payment system is shifting away from specialty care, ER care, so on and so forth, how do we you know, make that transition successful? So um, I would encourage anybody who's still wondering, think about primary care and family medicine as an area of an opportunity for you professionally. Um, I would also say that you know if, if you think that there are ways to change the system and make them better, when you work at a hospital, if it gets to the issue of law, that's basically what I do. My job is to remove obstacles away from our practitioners so that they can do more with care and deliver high quality care as effectively as possible. So keep that in mind when you're going through the ranks in terms of clinical leadership to feed it back and don't think of the system as inflexible, think of it as exactly the opposite. I'm gonna add something to that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. The, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act, a lot of people were upset about it because it was more than one page. But my, my feeling is that, you know, if, if someone's going to fix a bridge, I'd like them to have, like, all the blueprints in place, not just one page. So, you know, maybe we'll make it a little stronger somehow. So it's a really complicated thing to actually ensure everyone decrease the cost and improve the quality. I'm actually okay with taking that first step and deluging the market. I'd rather, you know, there's a case in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple weeks ago of a guy who had colon cancer. He found out about because he had constipation, he went to the ER. He couldn't afford the uh, specialty evaluation, so he, had, he gave himself an enema every day for two years until he showed up at the ER again and then died. So it's very possible that when he's insured, um, he may not have a primary care doctor available, but I'd rather that person be insured be in the system. I'd like to have the press and the need of hundreds of thousands of people saying, where's my doctor? That's going to put pressure on all of you to rethink about which field to go into. At the same time, the, the, this law does not fix that problem. It fixes the other problem, which is the, uh, the fact that people can be covered. Um, the average dermatologist in the United States, I shouldn't tell you this because everyone's going to be a dermatologist now, <laughs> is uh, $470,000 a year. That's the average. I don't know any primary care physicians who make that sort of money. So there's a, th this law does not address that, and the financial incentives to go into specialties are profound. And uh, I think once we have those 100,000 people in need and a call for doctors, that the medical schools will uh, respond. I can add to that as well. 
something that we will also need to be looking at on the local level is looking at the medically underserved areas of our community and making sure that we're getting doctors into those communities as well. And you know, it's not that you're out practicing in Bay Village or Rocky River or whatever neighborhoods are comfortable for you. It's that you're going to where there is a need of services and need of practitioners available in those local communities. Um, because a lot of times we run into it with a number of the individuals that we've served through CHAP and that we're trying to work with now for navigation services is that it's got to be close to where they live and or work otherwise they're not going to be able to get to your services um, and so if you want to serve that population if you have that altruistic part of your of your person um, make a concerted effort in your career to go where the need is um, and that's i will say as our organization has been doing that it's been exceptionally rewarding for us as individuals and as an organization and the people that we're serving Okay, and then we'll take one more question, Gloria, or what, we can take two more questions. Mine's pretty direct. Uh, when um, or if, it, do you think we'll ever get to the point we have a single payer system, and if so, by when? Um, the American democratic system is not designed to be very efficient intentionally. Um, I think that's been a long battle. I mean, you look at the fights that he was talking about with Truman, and even before then in the 20s when hospitals started to move away from simply psychiatric care and sort of in-home care for the rich, you know, these questions have always bubbled up. The difference is now there's a 24-hour news cycle and it's highly politicized. Um, if that is the eventual policy goal, I, I would think it would have to be an evolution of where it is currently. I, I saw someone... Uh, the other day uh, at the City Club talk about Medicare Part E, where you could basically purchase into Medicare for everyone. Um, but, you know, America, from a, from a policy standpoint around this issue, has always encouraged, uh, encouraged uh, individual responsibility in the private market. And um, I think that this is the first, uh, or the, at least the most recent challenge to the idea that you can contain the cost and the inflation of that cost without also including the concept of coverage. So what does that mean and what's the most efficient means? Um, I would say get elected to Congress and uh, whip a few hundred people and you should be fine. It's a very important point. Uh, how, how many people in the audience heard the, uh, a fellow named Nate Silver? So you know, the polit politicos here. So Nate Silver did a very, he, he's a baseball statistician who turned his prowess to uh, politics and he did a very interesting study in 2010 when the law passed. He looked at, he pulled insurance a agency owners, uh, big pharma, congr uh, Congress, president. He, he rated everyone in terms of the power, their ability to veto a bill or block a bill or put it forward. So he weighted all these power players. And then he said, okay, um, zero would be if we didn't do anything. A hundred would be single payer. How far towards a hundred could the United States go? That was in 2010 and putting all the power players together in the box that he weighed, he came up with a, a rating of 56. So the, the most liberal bill that passed the United States in 2010 had a, about a 56. The Affordable Care Act, he rated at 53. So in terms of, and, and I can tell you, for every one of those presidents from Teddy Roosevelt through Harry Truman, including Richard Nixon, if you can believe it, um, they probably went to 57. In other words, if you go past the line that he drew, it's not going to pass. Uh, Harry Truman's probably actually 100. Um, so th the answer to your question is the United States could go as far as about 56 points towards single payers as far as it could get. I actually think that number is probably a little lower now because of all the uh, up uproar about this. So I, I don't see the country passing single payer. I think it's remarkable that uh, any president got within three points on a 100 scale of as far as he could get. Uh, was there one more hand back there? No. Okay, um, if you wanna take a 10 minute break, anybody who wants to come back is welcome to. We're gonna have a short workshop. The, those sheets, if anyone did wanna sign up with their email for the yeah, doctors. Yeah, we also have sheets circulating please, around uh, the room for people forward. that wanna go Thank on the you. Doctors for America listserv. And materials mm -hmm. over by the door. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.